Hey everybody, Seth Monahan here from the Land of Music Theory, and I'm delighted to bring you video number 20 in my series on classical harmony and counterpoint. In this one, we're going to add a new harmonic function to the three we already know. It's what I call the subdominant function. Now, of all the videos I've made so far, I think this one can be summed up in the fewest words. Here it goes. Sometimes, four goes to one. That's kind of it. The rest of the video basically just unpacks that statement. And as usual, I'm going to load the front end of the video with all the need-to-know stuff, and then spend a lot of time exploring how all this plays out in real music. So let's get started. In videos 16 and 17, I introduced 4 and 4-6 as part of the big 18, and I told you that they had a predominant function. And that's often true, as we've seen. But it was also simplifying things, because, as you know now, sometimes 4 goes to 1. And when this happens, the chord is clearly not acting as a predominant because it doesn't go to the dominant. It's not rocket science, right? Now, there's a word you may already know that was traditionally used to describe motions from 4 to 1. These are often called plagal motions. Maybe you've heard of the so-called plagal cadence, which, big surprise, goes from 4 to 1. <laughs> Anyway, we have this word plagal, but it hasn't really been a part of traditional function theory. Old school function theories tended to sort of wring their hands about the fact that 4 doesn't always act like a predominant. Um, now, call me crazy, but I happen to think that theories should reflect what actually happens in music. And 4 goes to 1 all the time. So I invented a new function, S for subdominant. And before anything else, I want to clarify that when I say 4 goes to 1, we're not just talking about root position chords. All three inversions of four can carry the subdominant function. Though the one thing they have in common, as we'll see, is that they often put scale degree six in the foreground, melodically speaking. So the video has four sections. First, we'll look at cases where a single chord exerts a subdominant function. Then we'll see situations with multiple S chords. Then we'll look at two admittedly rare instances in which two has a subdominant function. And then we'll wrap up by looking at two common contrapuntal idioms, little harmonic melodic formulas that use the S function. So let's start simple with the slow movement from Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. Look at the first three chords here. We're in D flat major, and the first three bass notes are one, four, and one. And because all three chords are in root position, we've got tonic going to four, and then back again to tonic. And the functions here, of course, are two tonics with a subdominant function, a yellow S in between. And notice as well that the top voice, just as I predicted, puts scale degree six in the spotlight as an upper neighbor to five. Then the rest of the phrase is all harmony that we know. Predominant over scale degree four, dominant over scale degree five, then motion through five, four, two into one, six, and finally one. Let's listen. So now you can see that I didn't make this up. Sometimes four really does go to one. Still, let's take just a second to visualize our new expanded functional model. We've got tonic, which often goes to a predominant and finally to a dominant or we can skip the predominant and just toggle between tonic and dominant. But now there's this alternate path, the away and back again motion of the subdominant function, which never goes to predominant or dominant. It just goes back to tonic. And the only really tricky thing you have to remember here is that four can carry either a predominant or subdominant function. It depends on context. No chord, four or any other chord, has a function in a vacuum. Okay, so more examples. Here's one in minor from Schubert's Arpeggione Sonata. Let's follow the bass line again. It starts by dropping from 1 to 5 to 1, which we know will be tonic, dominant, and tonic. Then in the two-bar response, the bass moves 3, 4, 3. And as usual, we find 1-6 chords above scale degree 3. 
But what's above scale degree 4? It's not 542 as we might have seen in earlier videos. It's just a plain old 4 chord, the subdominant function surrounded by tonic functions. And notice here, too, the upper voice outlines a neighbor motion of scale degrees 5, 6, and 5 again. Let's listen. Now, we don't usually find 4, 6 on its own as the single subdominant chord in a cycle, but we do see 4, 6, 4, which you might remember is not actually in the Big 18. Here is a passage from Mozart's first mature violin sonata. For the first six bars, the pianist's left hand arpeggiates chords nonstop, and in a way that forces us to decide what notes are the, you know, quote-unquote, real bass line. Uh, in this case, it's the first note of each bar, which is the lowest note in each eight-note grouping. And the thing to notice here is that the bass line just doesn't move. It's just C. But while those six bars begin and end with tonic harmonies, there's another chord in between. 4-6-4. Four, four, with a subdominant function. And notice as well that the little call and response figures here in the piano and violin outline another motion from scale degree 5 up to scale degree 6 and back again. Let's hear just the first part of the phrase. Now, as for the rest of the phrase, we've got two non-overlapping functional cycles here. The first moves from 1 to 2 to 5, 7, and then to 6, which acts as a tonic substitute. put a pin in that one because we're going to deal with that six chord in the next video. And after this comes a standard cadential progression with the bass line rising three to four to five and then to tonic. Here's how the whole thing sounds. So now let's look at a few excerpts that use several chords with a subdominant function. These are the situations where we normally find 4-6 when it gets paired with root position 4 to create a longer subdominant region. Here's the opening of the slow movement from Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata. And let's start by looking at the bass line in chunks. The opening segment goes 1-3-2-1. And there are no accidentals here apart from the leading tone, so by now, we know that's likely to support tonics over 1 and 3, and some kind of dominant over scale degree 2. In this case, it's 5, 4, 3. And the end of the phrase uses those same three notes, 3, 2, 1, for the same purpose, uh, but now continues on to scale degree 7, which we know will support some kind of dominant function. But then there's the span in the middle. Here again, the bass line gets from 1 to 1-6, one but now it takes the long path through scale degree 6 and scale degree 4. These are 4, 6, and 4, our subdominant functions. Have a listen to the whole thing. Another one. Here is a slow movement from one of Haydn's Opus 20 string quartets, and the bass line in the opening three bars shows a pattern we just saw. Tonic descends by thirds through scale degree 6, scale degree 4, and finally down to scale degree 3. And just like in the last example, we've got tonics separated by a subdominant area made of 4, 6, and 4. But 
But let's rewind a bit. Here, over the sustained tonic in the bass, we also find an instance of 4, 6, 4, which we might also want to give a subdominant function. Now, I say might because we could debate whether that 464 is a real chord or just the byproduct of some inner voices noodling around, but we'll deal with that kind of interpretive question in a few videos down the line. Now, as for the rest of the phrase, we've got a very short functional motion where the leading tone rises to one in the bass, a standard dominant to tonic motion, and then a full cadential cycle with predominant one, four, five, five, one in the bass. And at the very end, we get an echo of that plagal motion uh, to 464 four that we heard at the start of the phrase. Let's have a listen. Our last example here is from the slow movement of Beethoven's first piano concerto. One of the things I love about this passage is how it saves the subdominant function for the climax, where it takes on a kind of special aura. So we've got two phrases here, and the first one uses just tonic and dominant. We start with one. The bass rises to two for a 5-4-3 chord. And then the bass starts to move on each beat with a change of function in the middle of every bar. So we've got 1 6 to 1, 5 6 to 5 7, back to 1, 1 6, and then 5. Let's listen to just that much. The consequent phrase starts similarly, but it speeds up the original stepwise ascent so that the second bar starts with a root position 4 chord. And here's our little subdominant climax, which is 3 chords long. 4, 4-6, four, then back to 4, which ultimately leads back to tonic, where we find a full cadential formula, the standard 4-5-5-1 bass line. So let's hear the whole period now. So now we switch gears to talk about the rare cases where two, not four, takes on a subdominant function. This only happens in very specific circumstances. And again, it's contextual. Two takes on a kind of plagal quality because of the way it behaves, which is to say when it doesn't act like a predominant. But I want to stress here, these are exceptions. So don't get confused here and start thinking that two can just go to tonic whenever it feels like it. It can't. So if you don't want to pay really a close attention, like don't even watch the rest of the video. Everything from this point forward is specifically for people who like to geek out on the fine print. People who really want a deep understanding of how the style works. If that's not you. That's totally fine. I'm sure you got the main gist of the video, which is, wait for it, Sometimes four goes to one. So the first very specific use of two with a subdominant function happens in early classical music, like before Beethoven's career even starts. And what we see sometimes are situations where two six just resolves directly into one six. We see this in one of Haydn's slow movements for keyboard. 
Check out the opening here. The bass moves through scale degrees 1, 4, and 3 in F major. Now, as usual, we're smart to assume that 1 and 3 support tonic harmonies. Since there are no accidentals complicating things, in the past, we would have assumed that scale degree 4 supported a dominant chord, namely 5-4-2. Today, we learned that 4 was also an option, though, but one that won't work with scale degree 2 in the melody. So what we find is 2-6 resolving directly to 1-6 in a kind of plagal motion. And again, we see this in a lot of early classical pieces, but it goes totally out of style by like the 1790s. As for the rest of the phrase, Haydn uses two more cycles. In bar 4, a dominant resolves to 6 as a tonic substitute. And this overlaps with the next cadential cycle with the formulaic 4, 5, 1 bass line. Have a listen. We find a very different use of the plagal two in the 19th century. There, in minor keys, composers sometimes have tonic go to two half diminished four two and back over a stationary bass. We see this in the first vocal entrance from Schubert's song cycle Winterreise. The bass line of the phrase is incredibly simple. It goes from one to five and then back to one. And the harmony is mostly predictable. Scale degree 1 supports tonic chords, and scale degree 5 supports dominant functions. The usual 1-2 punch of 1-6-4 to 5. So... But notice bar 3. The upper voices actually move here over the tonic pedal point, and together they make a 2 half diminished 4-2 chord, which goes directly back to 1 in the next bar. So I'm giving it a subdominant function, since it's actually really close to the 4-6-4 four, four chord we saw in the previous section. Here is tonic going to 4-6-4. Four, four. And here is tonic going to 2-4-2, two, two, which just adds one more note. It's a slightly crunchier version of 4-6-4. Four, four. Have a listen. Fremd bin ich eingezogen, fremd zieh ich wieder aus. Okay, one more of these. Also in the 19th century, composers often take major 4 to minor 4 and or to 2 half diminished 6 5 before going back to tonic. Chopin uses this progression at the opening and closing of his A flat major nocturne. He starts with tonic goes to major 4, turns that into minor 4, and then takes the upper voice up by step, making a 2-6-5, and then back to tonic. And this little lick here became such a cliché over the coming generations, it eventually got nicknamed the Hollywood Cadence. Uh, after Wagner used it to end a bunch of his most famous operas in the 1860s and 1870s, film composers went nuts with it. Here's Wagner using it at the end of the 14-hour ring cycle. And here is the film composer Alfred Newman using it in the 20th Century Fox fanfare from the 1950s, which, if you're like me, you thought was just part of the Star Wars soundtrack when you were a kid. Anyway, 
on to the last topic, and this one's pretty much extra credit as well. I want to point out two contrapuntal idioms that use the subdominant function. And by this, I mean not just a chord progression per se, but a progression that uses a specific upper voice formula as well. In the first idiom, we find the melodic notes 3, 4, 5 harmonized by 1, 4, 6, and 1, 6. We can see this in the slow movement of Mozart's E-flat major violin sonata. Most of the phrase uses bass line patterns we already know. It starts with scale degrees 1, 7, 1, which we know will be tonic, dominant, and tonic. And it ends with 3, 4, 5, which we can easily predict, will be 1, 6, moving to a predominant, and then finally to the cadential dominant, which again has 1, 6, 4 going to 5. But in bar 2, we see something new. The span between tonic and then scale degree 3 below is divided by a lone scale degree 6. That's actually a 4, 6 that carries a subdominant function. And as I mentioned already, this progression virtually always has the same top voice melodic motion, 3, 4, and 5, which is in the piano right hand here. So have a listen to it, played on historical instruments which are tuned a little bit flatter than my electric piano. So we find the same idiom in the slow movement of Haydn's second cello concerto. And indeed, that's not all that's the same. The whole phrase is built according to exactly the same template that Mozart used. Uh, follow the bass line. It starts with a 1-5-1 one, one motion. And then ends with the cadential 3-4-5 in the bass. And linking them is that same bass line that falls from scale degree 1 to 6 to 4 with a subdominant 4 6 in the middle. And of course, the melody over that progression is again scale degrees 3, 4, and 5. Have a listen. Okay, last idiom. In this one, the bass line 6543 is combined with a melody that goes 4365. So, as this happens, the harmony alternates subdominant and tonic functions, which isn't in itself that remarkable. But what is remarkable is that in this idiom, 164 has a tonic function. That we haven't seen before. Let's listen for it in the opening of Haydn's D major piano sonata. And I chose this piece because the first two bars are filled with instances of that old-timey plagal 2-6 chord that I talked about in the last section. Four times here, 2-6 resolves into 1-6. You'll hear that first, and then I'll scroll ahead to the next two bars. Okay, there in bar three is our idiom. As predicted, the bass line goes from 6 to 5 to 4 to 3, and the melody swaps the two halves of this line. So 4 goes to 3, as 5 goes to 6, and vice versa. And the harmonies are 4, 6, 1, 6, 4, root position 4, and 1, 6. Again, with 1, 6, 4 having a tonic function. And then the end of the phrase just leads through common harmonies, 5, 6 to 1 to 5, into a half cadence. Let's listen again. It goes by kind of fast, I know. Our very last example uses this same idiom in a really similar way. This one's from Mozart's K330 piano sonata, and it also starts with a short two-bar gesture that is repeated, and then the 6-5-4-3 bass line idiom 
and then seven, one, five in the bass, again, leading to a half cadence. Here's how it sounds. And I hate to end on a half cadence, but that, my friends, is all you need to know and probably way more than you needed to know about the subdominant function. In the next video, we'll deal with another chord that carries multiple functions. This time, it'll be the sub-median. So I'll see you then.